Hi, I'm Sharon Alley, and uh, welcome to Shabbat Morning. You are in my kitchen, and I'm here to talk about the parasha, which is Deuteronomy 7.12 to chapter 11.25. And as I speak, I'm going to have a natural time limit of doing things in the kitchen. Um, but to give you an overview, this is, as Danny pointed out last week, Moses' sermon. It's a second law, a retelling of these stories with a different perspective. Um, Moses gives his perspective. If the name is called Ekev, like the consequences. If you do this, these good things are going to happen to you. So it starts out reiterating the promise and all these blessings God will give the people if they obey his commandments. Um, it goes into a little bit description of the land. You get um, the seven species, you get description of the land as land flowing with milk and honey, and um, it carries on through a whole description of where things went wrong in the wilderness, the golden calf story retold by Moses and how he pleaded for the people, and keeps retelling these stories. We want to look at one specific story that he retells because it's our iconic verse that Jesus quotes. Um, but also another thing emphasized in this parasha is the fact that Israel was not given the land because of their own righteousness. Keep saying that. Don't, don't think it's because of your righteousness. It's not because you're righteous. And he says it three times in a row. So it's kind of an emphasized point, lest they forget. Because sometimes when things go well with you, you might assume it's because of something you did right, when in fact it is not. And um, so that's a great reminder. And we come all the way to the end where, um, you know, there's a promise everywhere you put your foot on, you will, you will receive it. But on condition that you're obeying God every step of the way. So, in this whole spiel, back in chapter 8, verse 3, we have a very famous verse um, quoted by Jesus in the wilderness when he's talking to, or when Satan is tempting him. Um, and it says, you can quote it. Lo al halechem levado yihye ha'adam, ki im al kol motza pi Adonai yihye ha'adam. I may not have quoted it perfectly. Um, not by bread alone will a person live, but on everything that springs forth from the mouth of God will a human live. And so I want to focus, talk about that a little bit. And as I'm talking, I'm going to be making some challah, um, just to prove that it's not by bread alone. And as I said earlier, it will be a natural time constraint because it takes me 15 minutes to knead. So what I did in advance is just get my yeast going so I won't take up endless time. And of course the yeast is mixed with honey which is one land flowing of milk and honey. So that's a nice little thing to have as well. Um, so why would we think that humans would live on bread alone? If you live in Vietnam, you probably don't think that. And if you live, I don't know, there are other places that still eat other grains and they make porridge with it, they don't make bread. Um, some places make noodles. But in this part of the world, bread is a staple and has been. And in fact, as I mentioned um, a few sermons ago, it goes back to our very first meal in creation. So the bread I'm making tonight is challah, which is, you know, not an ancient way of making bread, and it has eggs in it. Um, but it's considered to be a festive bread, I guess, in Europe. Um, that was a tradition. And it also has oil in it. And most people love oil. Humans, we just... We like that. So, um, so in the very beginning, bread was a food given to humanity. Well, it says seed-bearing grass, which is your grain family. And as I said, here in this region of the world, they make that into bread. Maybe adding our ingredients here. 
I'm going to use some yeast instead of letting the bread sit out and naturally do whatever. So bread in the Bible, not only is it a staple, but the word bread is used as meal. Um, it's a symbol of all of our sustenance. So I'm going to use spelt. It's a nice ancient grain because it goes well with me. So I'm stirring in our seven cups of spelt flour initially. And I'm thinking of this image of bread and how important every day you have to have bread or it's like you haven't eaten. And when Moses gives this famous verse in Deuteronomy 8, he retells a story of the manna. And it's curious because he says the whole point of that story was to test people whether they would follow God's instruction. And he says, rather than bread being what sustains you, it's actually everything that comes out of God's mouth that sustains you. And that's what the manna was supposed to teach us. And of course, what we need to do when we're looking at this parasha, when Moses is retelling it, we need to look back and see how things were told the first time. Because those little differences add a nuance of understanding. And sometimes he's augmenting something that was already there. So if we read our Exodus text carefully, if you go back to Exodus 16, you'll find the manna story there. And... It's one of the first kind of um, miracle stories. It comes right before water from the rock in the book of Exodus. And the people are grumbling because they don't have enough to eat. And are you, you know, are you trying to make us die of hunger? But the interesting thing is the focus is not just the provision of bread. God says, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. And he also, it's also mixed in with the quail story. Um, but the goal of it is to see still if they're going to follow God's instructions. And so he says it in a unique way. He says, everyone, the whole nation is going to go out and they're going to gather in a thing for each day. So he's talking about the manna here, but he actually doesn't use the word Manna, which is man, he uses a thing for thing or word, davar. And most typically word, but it can be an event, something that happens. We're going to come over here now. So I've just added, got my cup of warm water, and now we are going to knead this to make it good. As we think about God trying the people in the wilderness. The whole point was to see if they would follow his Torah, his instruction. That's what Exodus 16.4 says. And so this bread that's rained down from heaven is actually a test, and it has a goal. And then Deuteronomy reminds us of that test. And he says, this was to test you, to show you that man does not live by bread alone. And there's some clues when he, the words he chooses, he says, but by everything that comes out of the mouth. And he uses motza pi, a thing that comes out. Motza can be an exit, it can be a spring of water, it can be um, a word that comes out. And that is actually being picking up off of the Exodus 16.4, a word for its day, I think. And it's a great... Um, metaphor in the language because when I hear motza, like any language, you hear one word and you, you know that whole word and all its meanings. And so I think about springs and how water in the wilderness, water gushes out, it comes forth. And God's word is like water. Um, Deuteronomy 33, Moses even says that my teaching is like rain. And um, we have this theme also throughout the Bible. So I was just um, thinking about this word, motzapi, everything that comes out of the Lord's mouth. 
and connecting that to something for every day, if you go back to Exodus 16. So basically, every day we need a fresh word from God's mouth. And when you look at the Bible, you know, it's the same text over and over, but there is a freshness. There's a fresh word every day for us. And we need it to live. We need it to stay alive. And water is a perfect image of that fresh, because there's always new water bubbling out. And so when I imagine it, not that you can imagine God's mouth per se, but I kind of imagine of a spring bubbling forward with something new and fresh for us that day, a fresh word. And um, there are also contexts specifically that use motza pi, like to come out of the mouth as a, an oath of taking a vow and even promises. Um, in Psalm 89.35, it says, I won't break my covenant or what's gone out of my lips. I will not change. And it uses the same motza. There instead of motza pi, it's motza svatai. So back to um, motza being a spring. It can either be with or without the word mine. Um, if you look in Psalm 107, verse 33, you have a reference there of turning the wilderness into uh, motza e mine for the thirsty. Um, and that, that is also retelling our story, in the, I think, in our historical psalm. But I wanted to read a verse with you from Isaiah 41. And this is taken from around verse 18. I'll start in verse 17. I, the Lord, will respond to their prayers. I, the God of Israel, will not abandon them. I will make streams flow down the slopes and produce springs in the middle of the valleys. I will turn the wilderness into a pool of water and the arid land into springs. And that last word, springs, is our word, moza. So, God is going to make springs, and it's a metaphor for us, people who are hungry and thirsty and poor, we need water, and we become springs. So, if you look elsewhere in Isaiah, Isaiah 58, verse 11, I'll read that for you too. The Lord will continually lead you. He will feed you, even in parched regions. He will give you renewed strength, and you will be like a well-watered garden. Okay, so now we've just switched from being in the place to being that place itself. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring that continually produces water. And I think that's beautiful because we've come full circle. We are completely dependent on God's word to stay alive. And that life in us naturally bubbles out to other people. His words that come in us, we teach out to others. And it's this, um, and it gives us life and it passes life on. We become that spring. And, and water is a beautiful metaphor because it keeps renewing itself. It's life-giving and it seems eternal. It just keeps springing forth. So may we be those springs that not only are we taking in God's word every day for us, um, which is new even though it's from an old text, but may we be then multiplying it out that we're also passing on a word every day to somebody else and giving them renewed life. So here we are with our bread. It's risen. I'm going to punch it down. And I will be dividing it and 
making it into six little snakes so that we can braid our hara. So we're making our nehashim here, the little snakes. Um, and I was thinking more about that first manna story that Deuteronomy is referring to and how every day they had to go out and get something and they couldn't hoard it. And if they hoarded it, it went bad on them. Except for Shabbat when there was a miraculous provision and it stayed fresh for two days. And that reminded me just of the Lord's Prayer and how we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And we never get enough to feel like we're safe and we're in control. We get just enough for today. And God knows better than we do that we're limited and we need a little bit at a time. It's too fluffy there. And um, that principle, you know, part of hoarding is you want to be in control. And we all have to have reminders. And maybe Shabbat's a weekly reminder that you're not in control. God is. And we're completely dependent on that provision for that day. And we can't actually handle too much, and we certainly can't handle too little. So we have to constantly come back for our set amount. So here we go. So here I'm just pinching our snakes together. I got six of them. And we're just gonna do over two under one. So over two under one, over two. Move them over. Over two, under one, over two. Over two, under one, over two. Over two, under one, over two. Also be a lesson for us to uh, take time to ponder that word we're given. Sometimes things need to sit a while for them to fully um, be impactful. Over there, the light little ones. A little more on that side. Quite a bit more right there. Back over there. More, more, more. Take more paint. Every time, take more paint. Sides. Okay, you do a little bit on the sides. There you go. Ooh. I'm helping you. Is that enough? There, that's good on the sides. Now do this on top. All right. Wait, right here. Uh, I think it's good enough. We're going to pop it in the oven. Thank you. 
כי בו שבת מכל מלאכתו אשר ברא אלוהים לעשות. מי רוצה לברך? הוא רוצה ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם המוציא לחם מן הארץ. אמן. 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 אמן.